Hello, and welcome to another of my series of conversations. My name is John Cornicello, and I'm going live on Mondays and Thursdays at 10 Pacific and 1 Eastern. On Thursday, my guest is going to be Drew Hendricks from Red River Paper to answer all your questions about inkjet printing papers. But today, my guest is photographer, artist, and educator, John Paul Caponegro. So let me introduce John Paul to tell you a bit about himself and some of his recent projects. Take it away, John. Hey, John. Thank you for having me, and it's nice to see sure, you. Sure, thank you. Your faces. Um, Shiwi, Mueller, Resnick, apparently I will be embarrassed or uh, the truth will be told <laughs> through pictures. <laughs> and God, Chef is here with Photoshop to fix them. <laughs> it's nice to see a lot of alums too. Katie and Keith and Mike, Janet, a lot of nice faces. Um, so you're up in Maine. I'm in Cushing, Maine, little tiny town, 1,500 people. I'm 25 minutes away from the Maine Media Workshops, which is one of the mm -hmm. reasons I live here. <laughs> My father was one of the first instructors there. I was five. We listened to a lot of Bert and I, and he taught photography. I later became the first digital instructor there. And uh, still involved in that community that I teach my own workshops out of my studio and around the country and then around the world with uh, my esteemed colleague here, Seth Resnick, as we go to Antarctica and Namibia, one of the places we love. We go to places we love and we take wonderful people with us, like some of the people I mentioned, Katie, Mike, Janet, they've all been in Greenland. Yeah, so this has probably been a tough year for travel and workshops. Yeah, uh, Seth and I got back from Antarctica and everything started shutting down. And Except so, they did have the sign in um, Atlanta airport, the, the Americans right on top of it, that if you have a cough or you're sneezing, you should see your doctor because you may have Ebola. <laughs> 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 but you know, hey, what's story. It's not a disease. <laughs> mm, yeah, yeah. So yes, uh, I've been stationary ever since. And that's allowed me to catch up with uh, all of the images I've shot with the 12 trips I've taken with Seth. She was on the first three uh, down to Antarctica and go through all of the images, reprocess many of them, think about what that book looks like because I've been planning about that book for a very long time. Uh, went through a writing workshop and because of the writing workshop, the writer who was guiding us uh, said, you know, you really should think about getting the altered images in there as well. So I'm gonna release two eBooks. One is, uh, Antarctica Awake and the other is Antarctica Dreaming, which is a collection of all the images that I've made that are altered. They might include other sources other than Antarctica, they might not, but they're not those documentary shots. And the, the relationship between the two has been really fascinating, as well as revealing that through writing. You know, I, I studied art and literature, uh, first at Yale and then at the University of Santa Cruz, and uh, got a major in both and, and have written professionally as well as uh, made images and when I say images, I draw. These guys used mm -hmm. to tease me for sketching on the back of the boat in Antarctica. I said, JP, hey, the, the shots are over here. You know, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. <laughs> I say, and I say, you make other people's pictures if you don't draw, if you don't write. <laughs> and so very often I would, I would go down below and, and write and get those things out. A matter of finding a different relationship with things. So I feel like I've gone back to uh, almost like an MFA program because I then subsequently followed that with a writing workshop I'm still taking with uh, Richard Blanco, who was uh, Obama's presidential inaugural poet, a fascinating Cuban immigrant, uh, Latin X, just wonderful teacher. Uh, great to have this online community experience that can be extended. I've also been doing a little market research because I knew that I wanted to take some of the things I was doing online and I wanted to see what worked with Zoom, what didn't, how, how education could be extended through an online experience. I don't think it replaces the physical experience, certainly not when you need to go to Antarctica or uh, also when you need to make a print because, you know, I just showed you a print, but I, I can't, you can't evaluate the, the print that way. You, you, need to, you need to hold it. You need to look at it closely. But that's a very hands-on experience. But the writing workshop has been fantastic. And actually that longer extended time has allowed us to write more. And I wonder what that would do to my workshops. If, if my students had more time, uh, what could they do in that time? Also, would they? Because a, a workshop is also an immersive experience. You take a week away from your life and you just dive in and you turn off the phone and you don't answer the email and you get up at six o'clock in the morning or earlier and you stay out till late at night. And it's like, it's a full on 18, 20 hour day. 
and, and you're not doing the other things where if you're doing over six weeks, you're doing everything else. Mm -hmm. And so I, I wonder, will, will my alums be able to carve that time away from them and really use that? I know that I have, and uh, the slowdown of COVID made it possible. Instead of taking that workshop, I was supposed to be teaching my own workshop. And now I've just sort of dug in. I've, I've, I've literally written two books of poetry. Um, it's gonna turn into three. Um, and I, I have every intention of getting stuff published. And it's changed the way that I write the text and speak the audio for the videos that I release on my series. And one is about to come out in the next, well, let's call it two weeks, sometime soon. If you're part of my newsletter, you'll get the alert, you'll get the free ebook, you'll, you'll get a, a gallery exhibition online with an audio tour and you'll be able to hear the video. There's something uh -huh. about audio, the voice going with the pictures that really makes things stick. The guy who's producing it for me used to work for me for a decade. He's got a really great sensibility for it, but it really was a wake up call for me after 10 years of working with me, Charlie produced the first video and he said, you know, JP, I think I finally get it. <laughs> Wait a minute. You were helping me produce some of these prints. You were helping me the, the last 10 years and now you get it. This, this audio, video, voice, image, word, picture thing is very powerful. So how do people sign up for the newsletter? Just go to my website and sign up for the newsletter. At the bottom of every page, there's a sign up. Is it just John Paul Caponegro or JP? JohnPaulCaponegro.com, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, I think it was Seth who did me, JP, and when my wife started using it, I knew it would stick. <laughs> um, you know, Newler and Shiwi reinforced that. So I think they trained everybody in the studio to you know, start calling me JP. I, I, I blame all of them. Wait a minute, um, my contact the, with you is spankmehearts.com. Have you changed oh, the, uh, have you changed your website? Uh, <laughs> isn't there this thing called plausible deniability? Ah, okay. <laughs> you, know anyway. what I love about, you know what I love about you, honest to God? I mean, <laughs> honest to God. Can you really you say You are it? the only photographer, image maker, that I've ever known, including the explorers, that is intellectually fascinating. Thank I you. Mean, that's a fact. Thank you. You know, um, I think Jay. And very well educated. <laughs> Overeducated, some would might say. I, I learned to endeavor to eschew obfuscation at Yale. <laughs> and I, then I learned to write a simple sentence at University of Santa Cruz. And I had a great education in education between the two. You mean you didn't, go to, background. you didn't go to Trump University? <laughs> Not yet. Oh, okay. Aren't we all in that right now? Goodness. No, don't answer <laughs> oh, <no>. that. <laughs> not going to go there today. No. Feels yes, enough. Let's not go time. there. We're not. No. Um, you know, I so, but always say a shoe obfuscation. <laughs> <laughs> we are not in pursuit of untamed ornithoids. <laughs> <laughs> Cryptogrammous concretions decline repose on calciferous accretions. Go look that up. You'll have fun with it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, Santa you know, Cruz is going through a rough time right now. Yeah, yeah. The fires. The fires out there Amazing. are crazy. I, I was reading the headlines this morning and I, I went, ran into this wonderful phrase after, I think it was, it was either Saturday or Sunday, which is the day where they marked the, oh, the renewable resources, the amount that human beings consume during the year. Uh, there's a point at which it's renewable and there's a point past which we're consuming more than our fair share or m what we can't continue to renew. And that was, that was Sunday, which has moved, been moved back two or three weeks due to COVID. It's been moving uh, back every week, but we actually gained a couple of weeks because people have slowed down. Um, and, and in the same headlines, there was a fire NATO warning. What about that, Seth? Yeah, they were on. Did you see them? They're yeah. clean. There was They're a amazing. house. The house got devoured in 20 seconds. They yeah. just literally, the, the thing came in and it, the house just literally like exploded, gone. Yeah. Yeah, I just wrote a poem about uh, Paradise, uh, not, not Paradise Lost, uh, Paradise, California, which was basically lost in right. four hours. Uh, wow. That was one of really? the most destructive wildfires in the history of the country. Yeah. Uh, you know, but um, let's go back to your photography. Yeah, let's go back to that. <laughs> let me let me pick back up. You know, okay. So hopefully there is some fascination, Mike. And um, you know, on a real uh, street level, let's get down to to something Jay Mazel said years ago. I was I was sitting with the Fine Art of Photography panel and uh, cast of rogues, which included Joe McNally and Jay and me in that order. 
Joe starts out and showing his great pictures and, you know, if you, if you want to make more interesting pictures, meet more interesting people, go to more interesting places. And Jay picks up after Joe's five minutes. You know, if you, if you want to make more interesting pictures, be more interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then he leans over to me and it kind of elbows me. So what's, what's going to be tonight? More poetry? <laughs> yeah, Jay, it is. <laughs> Uh, I used to wonder, like, how did my liberal arts education help? But actually, it gave me this rich foundation and all of these connections to other things. I think uh, one of the things I've been emphasizing this year on a lot of the uh, creativity sessions, seminars, interviews that I've done, and I'll actually feature some of this, and I'll feature this one in, uh, in a future newsletter in a couple of weeks, is um, how writing can help photographers, how drawing can help photographers, how a lot of those inspirations from other disciplines, those different ways of seeing or different ways of being, and they're the very thing that fertilize and cross-pollinate and lead to new ideas and breakthroughs and uh, add a richness and a depth and a connectivity to the work that, you know, if it's just well-crafted, personally, I think photography is, is as, as a whole, as a as a young medium and as a community is, is guilty of uh, creating far too many well, well, well crafted nothings. You know, just, just cause you focused it, did you really see it? I remember an alum, a New Yorker, you New Yorkers are fantastic. Bottom line it, right? He was taking one of my workshops. This is Jay Ritter who lives out in Santa Fe, New Mexico, but was up here taking my fall foliage workshop. And we're sitting on the bench waiting for the rest of the crowd to come back. He says, so JP, did you get the picture? I said, I think I got the picture. He said, so you got the picture, but did you show up? And if you did show up, what did you bring to the picture? <laughs> Those are fantastic questions, questions to hold for a lifetime things to live by and and it doesn't all come out of photography photography about photography it's very meta it's, you know it's very smart but it's often kind of sterile photography about people photography about your passions photography about your relationships photography about what you love that's what makes it interesting you're the thing that makes your photographs interesting i mean photography is fascinating but without you it's nothing that's great so where do you want to go from here <laughs> <laughs> I want to see if people in the audience have some questions. Yeah. We've got the chat window or you can unmute. Sure. So how is it, how is it that you embarked on this um, career of adventure workshop, shall we say? Uh, I knew as a surrealist, I would never get an NEA grant. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, if I stepped it back a little further, you know, as the first digital printing instructor at Maine, Santa Fe, Palm Beach, Rocky Mountain, you know, it was early days before color management. Remember those painful days, <laughs> <should> we? <laughs> um, and I realized I had more to teach. Uh, and while they could sell that, and I was known for that, and, and I enjoy doing that, I still do. Um, I knew I knew I had other things that could only happen in the field, and so. While they couldn't sell that or they didn't want to sell that because they were busy selling my printing workshops, I started doing my own things domestically. And then Michael Reichman, let me step back two things because this is, this is really an interesting story in terms of the power of being clear about what you want, setting an intention, and how sometimes it comes along a lot faster and a lot easier than you ever intended. Um, there came a point in my life where I, I reconsidered everything. And one of the things I did was I wrote a bucket list and at the very top of the bucket list was go to Antarctica, something I'd been inspired by Elliot Porter to do because my mom designed and helped edit and select and sequence the whole production of that book. Uh, so to see this 80 year old codger go down to Antarctica several times before people were doing that in tourism, this was a National Science Foundation grant. You would go from Chile on this boat for a long time. So I wanted to go and, and Antarctica was right on the top of my list. It must have been six months later, Michael Reichman calls up and says, hey, JP, do you want to go to Antarctica? I'm going to run this workshop down there and I need some extra instructors. Oh, by the way, Shiwi and Resnick and Steve Johnson and uh, um, who am I missing? I'm missing one. Uh, at any rate, there were five of us teaching 
first time on the academic Shokowski and we got to Antarctica and had an absolutely fabulous time. And it was, I think it was so much fun because Ian, right? of the diversity. Well, Ian was there, but I don't think he was teaching. There's, a, there's another teacher that we're missing here. Um, it'll come to me. I'm, I'm, I'm in the middle of the story. Michael so taught. what's that? Michael taught. Michael taught. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So maybe that's what I'm thinking. Um, so then I was watching how Ma Michael put that together and I said, you know, this is an amazing thing. I've just been served a really great lesson about how you can make things happen for yourself and for others at the same time. But I didn't want to start going into competition with him out of respect. And he suffered from seasickness. So by the third trip, he <laughs> said, I I'm done. Right. The minute he said, I'm done. I said, okay, time to start something. Longer story short, I call up Seth and say, Seth, let's make this happen. And we did. And we've gone, including those trips, 12 times. And we just got back again in February for, for the, from the 12th time. So part of it was um, learning from others. The other was uh, finding the right people to work with. Uh, but the most important thing was, was clearly identifying what I wanted to do most and being persistent enough, patient enough, resourceful enough. I mean, we had to come up with a whole new model with the tour company to accommodate our groups because they were used to dealing with groups of different capacities with different needs or maybe just selling the whole boat. And, you know, we tried that once and that, did, that didn't work for us because we couldn't reach out and make contact with all of the people that are on the boat that want to contact with us. So we go with smaller groups now. Um, so it's, it's been a wild, wonderful ride. So I'm getting a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, one is, why are you doing eBooks instead of print books? Your work is so dynamic in print. The economics of print and publishing, mm -hmm. the publisher's deals, uh, and, the, and the changing landscape of that. Uh, I've, I've literally had five publishers uh, say they wanted to publish it and even had a contract in hand before one publisher called up and said, don't sign that contract. I can't tell you why. Uh, it was a very nice thing because six weeks later, they went into bankruptcy. So that whole field has been changing. And it's been very interesting for me because um, I, you know, I watched my mother, a graphic designer, produce all of my dad's books, a majority of Elliot Porter's books. George O'Keefe's, uh, well, Alfred Stieglitz's portrait of George O'Keefe. I think of it as George O'Keefe's because she worked with O'Keefe. And that's, that's where I got to meet her and watch that whole production and, and the production of the show and go to the National Gallery. A lot of people think about the influence of my father as a finer black and white photographer. And absolutely, he taught me the fundamentals there. And that I, I learned on a, on a view camera and in the silver darkroom with him. And as a kid before that, even before I decided to get interested in that, I was uh, hanging out with him while he was in, the, in teaching his workshops. Um, some of my favorites were when he, Ansel, and Jerry Olsen would get together all at the same time. Maybe Wynn Bullock would be in the wings, but the three of them were a, a marvelous combination. I learned so much from being around all of these people. And my mother introduced me to so many others. And sometimes there were painters like O'Keefe and sculptors and filmmakers. And um, it, was, it was a really rich uh, experience, education in and of itself, even though it wasn't academic. Quite the opposite, really. Uh, so... Rich what, background. Yeah. What about handmade artist books or a limited edition? Have you considered those? Or is I have. I have. It's a lot of work. Mm -hmm. Are people really willing? Are they really willing to pay what those handmade books uh, take to make um, as as unique collectible items that might go into the right collection? If it wasn't a lot of time that took me away from making other images, mm -hmm. uh, then I would think about that. And and I am definitely going to be pursuing looking for the right publisher for the others, but I may ultimately just self-publish this Antarctica book uh, and, and one other. Uh, one of the delays is um, my dad and I are working on a two generations book. We have an exhibit where we exhibit side by side. It's basically my collection of his works and my evolving collection of my own. And uh, we're producing a book and I've, I basically pulled all that material together three plus years ago uh, and handed it to my mom and said, here, will you design it? <laughs> When your mom is not um, deadline oriented, how's that for diplomacy? <laughs> uh, cool. So I would love for her to be involved because I learned from her about picture editing, about the power of how two images go together and how a sequences of images can, if not tell a story, then um, guide you through a, a compelling 
set of intellectual or emotional transitions, that it wasn't just one static thing and then whoops, we're on to the next thing, mm -hmm. that the images spoke with one another. They have a conversation, particularly in a book form where you know there's two pages, one facing the other, one image with the other. But also when you turn the page, there's, there's a persistence and a flow and an arc. So making these eBooks and I make uh, print on demand catalogs, mag cloud books that are very accessible, takes me, cost me 10 bucks to produce them, cost my, my folks who buy them 10 bucks because it just makes it accessible. And mm -hmm. I look at the, uh, the printed book as something that's less accessible. I mean, things have changed. Elliot's first book that mom designed, there were 40,000 copies. Uh, now today, a run of 3,000 is, is, is rather large. And uh, well, that's you know, the economics and then who's promoting them, pushing them. Uh, it's really changed a lot, but also it's opened up. Uh, I also, uh, <laughs> I really chuckle when a curator tells me, gosh, we love this show, but we need a book. And I say, so how many copies of the book do you plan to sell? Uh, well, we don't know. Uh, and, and you're probably going to make what, five, 10 bucks a copy? Yeah, you know, if we're lucky. Uh, right. And, and so if you're lucky, yeah, you'd be lucky to sell a hundred of those, right? Oh yeah, that, that'd be really good. So you really think a thousand dollars is going to cover your utilities, your <laughs> employees, your <laughs> overhead, like you're really worried about this thousand dollars, but we need a book and the publishers are turning around and say, well, we, we need an exhibit in order to uh, do the book. <laughs> I'm like, can you guys talk to each other? <laughs> So it reminds it's me of the music too. business. You used to tour to sell records and then you sell records to sell tours and it goes back and forth. And yeah, yeah. You know, George Tice actually considers, and for those of you who don't know George Tice, go find out. Mm -hmm. I'm talking to some of my alums. I know a couple of you don't know who George Tice is. Many of you do. Uh, George Tice is a really brilliant printer and one of the icons of 20th century photography. Uh, but he considers the book his... Uh, primary medium. Uh, he's shooting four books and he feels like more people see his images in print and that he makes a more complete statement through the book. Now, this is a guy who printed for Steichen as well as for himself. So that's a fascinating statement, but that's a 20th century perspective as well. And I think we need to rethink why we print, what prints do, uh, when the old timers say, it's not a photograph until it's printed, I just want to slap them, <laughs> but I don't. Uh, because that doesn't really help us understand all of the unique things about what a print does. That prints persist, that prints are shareable, that they're durable, that they're saleable, that in making a print, you look at your images with much more care and consideration in grabbing, deciding which material and which scale, you're making a lot of decisions that communicates your intention, your relationship to the images. You, your understanding of your work and the world and yourself grows deeper by making prints. And the same thing is true of books. A book is just an extended print in another medium, uh, but it has a very specific form. You know, like putting together an exhibit, it has a sequence, but even, even longer. And there could be chapters, and it's often paired with text, as many but exhibits it's, are. It's well. so different now with everything online, with purchasing with through Amazon and the other online booksellers. I mean, I remember in 20 years ago, I used to go into a Barnes & Noble or a Brentano's, go to the photo section, and look through the books and decide what to buy, and just see how the printing was. And it was such a different experience than today. It is. It is. You know, I, 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 my mom was kind of um, at the apex of producing some of the finer photographic books ever produced, not just because of the graphic design, not just because of the editing sequencing, but also because she would show up on press. And mm -hmm. as a painter who had turned to graphic design, she also understood printmaking. And so Elliot and O'Keefe wanted her on press because they knew the printed page, the book would be that much more beautiful. Uh, sometimes the pressmakers would say, hey, look, you know, you, you're actually doing printmaking here and we need to make a profit. <laughs> <laughs> but they knew that may, they might lose a little money on that, but it would be this thing that would win awards or um, really promote their brand or their reputation as, as, as brilliant printers. Yeah. So, so um, Fasako is asking you how you keep interested and excited about your photography. What makes you tick? And also what happened to your sculpture? <laughs> Oh my, uh, what happened to my sculpture is still coming. Uh, and, and I collaborated with another procrastinator, so I got to take it back. And 
um, it, it'll be another year or two, but things are, things are definitely going to happen. Um, Sako has traveled with me a lot. We've talked a lot and she knows that, uh, that uh, sculpture has been a major influence to me and still is. In fact, I have this little um, journal, I call it a journal, but it's basically a timeline of all the artists who have influenced me. And I noticed about 10 years ago, the 80% of the people who made the list, and there's just a few every year, 80% were sculptors. Um, you know, I consider my images to be environmental sculpture in virtual space. I don't want to make, mark the land, but I do want to participate in the activity that maybe Smithson enjoyed or, or better. Uh, you know, the, the standing stones that my dad photographed in the British Isles and their, that, that cultural way of relating to landscape and reshaping it for sacred purposes has always been tremendously influential. And so I need to make some physical objects and, and it's going to involve photography in an unexpected way as well. Uh, so it's coming, but it's, uh, it's just taken a little while. It's interesting to see what comes fast and what comes slow. I didn't anticipate poetry to come to the front. But so Saka, a, Saka wouldn't be surprised that uh, yeah. I just wrote a whole book of um, ekphrastic poetry, poetry based on other people's art. In this case, it's um, Hokusai's uh, 36 Views of Mount Fuji. Fuji yes. So I've written a whole series of haiku to go with those images. Um, and that, that was that was great fun to do that. She knows how much I enjoy both of those things. Yeah, so Jim is asking, as a multimedia artist, when you create artistic experiences in photos or illustrations or poetry, how do you decide the, the mode that's going to best express your thoughts? I think every project, and I do work in series and projects, um, I don't exclusively work that. I do a lot of tests. I have a whole list of experiments, planned experiments. Try this, JP. See what you can learn from it. Uh, and in fact, this is my number one catalyst, my sketchbook, my prompter. And when I pick it up, it said, why are you trying to make the same old photograph with this? This is a different device. Think differently. Um, so I make a lot of those experiments. And the ones that I'm interested in, if I can repeat them and they have enough heat, uh, that it feels like I would repeat them often enough to create a series, then, then I start thinking about what the uh, best way to present them is. Um, I think it's really important to figure out what box you're operating with initially. I mean, everybody wants to think outside the box, but in order to think outside the box, you first have, a, have to have a box. So I draw my boxes in pencil and I might erase an edge and I'm deliberately trying to make experiments to push the box and see at what point it falls apart and say, no, nope, that's not it, that's an outlier. And at what point uh, these things do group together because once I've got one or two things, maybe six things that relate, maybe I'm playing it too safe. Maybe that's too narrow. So I'm deliberately trying to stretch it and think about how many different ways I could approach this work. Um, and I often find that multiple experiments and multiple series kind of cross pollinate each other. In other words, one you, comes up with an idea or the outlier for one might become the seed for the next body of work. Do you, ever, do you ever go out with the camera with no preconceived ideas or thoughts in your head? <laughs> Let me rephrase that question and just take it up a notch. That's kind of a question I've been asked for years. Do you pre-visualize or do you post-visualize? Yes. Yes. And so the, the question is, how am I different? How did I change my experience because I decided to pre-visualize? How did my experience change because I decided to post-visualize? And if, well, I'm in a new, a if I'm in a new situation, how do I choose? Because I know the moment I take one step, I've changed the stream, I've changed me, the, the outcomes are going to start to shift. No, I think what I'm, what I'm really asking is, it sounds like you uh, pre-visualize the day or days before. And then you go out and you take those pre-visualizations and conform it into the box, so to speak. What I'm talking about is going out the day of, and as you're walking down the path, to begin to pre-visualize, not a week or two weeks or a month ago, Yes, I do that. How often? Um, that long, huh? 
No, I'm trying to figure out how to answer this in a, in a way that's um, helpful. Uh, Seth knows that I'm schizophrenic uh, or multiple personality disorder is probably closer to that. I go, out with, all I go out with two minds and it's been hard to kind of oscillate between the two, but I've been able to learn to track both at the same time. Um, I'd like to come to a place, particularly for the first time, fresh and not try and fit it into a box or a preconception or only see the things that I've planned to see, even though I may have done some research. I want to get out there and experience it. And part of that for me is I need to walk a place. I need to walk through in and around a place. I need to get the place into me. I need to make all those discoveries that I couldn't when I wasn't there. And I'm often sketching with this, just very quickly, freely taking pictures without worrying about is this perfectly composed or perfectly exposed or do I know exactly where it's going? I'm just simply savoring the place. But then halfway through, sometimes there's a third way through, don't get stuck on the halfway through. Halfway through I'll shift and say, okay, so what's really happening here? Where do I wanna go? What am I most interested in? How does this connect to what I'm already doing? Or is this taking me a new direction? What is that direction? And I start asking questions. Every picture is not only an acknowledgement of what's there and that I am present, but it's also a question. What happens when I do this? How am I different? How is the place different? How do I experience the place differently? And I think if you ask better questions, you get better results. So I'm constantly asking as many questions as I can in as many different ways as I can. And then after I get this embarrassment of 10,000 images or 10,000 words or 10,000 ideas, I have got to come down and say, okay, what am I going to commit my life to? Because I, I literally can't, I can't execute all the ideas I come up with. I can't photograph everything that I'd like to photograph. I can't even present all the photographs I have. So I was saying, hey, where's the sculpture? I'm sorry, I just caught up with 12, 12 trips to Antarctica <laughs> and this other body of work I've been working on for 10 years, which I'm going to release shortly after that. Oh, and by the way, there were these uh, Google Earth screenshot things that some of you who track me on Instagram know I've been layering on heartbeats and brain waves and eyes and sound waves on top of shots made from Google Earth because I can't go to Antarctica right now. We, we canceled our trip to Namibia in July, so I'm going to Namibia about Google Earth and I'm making my pictures. <laughs> you know, did I plan to do that? No, I'm just, I'm enjoying it. Is it giving me all kinds of ideas? Yeah, in fact, I thought it was a study and that's why I posted it with paper border. Just, I know photographers, painters know all about studies. You know, they're the preliminary work that goes before you make the finished work. So what is that for photographers if it's finished in 125th of a second? Well, it's all the shots before and it's all the ideas before. Um, so I thought it was a study, but it's building up interestingly enough and there's enough of them and it has, it has many more likes. I think it's finished work. Yes, I got some copyright issues to go with that. I got to talk to Seth a little bit about, uh, can I sell these things? Because I can't get a good answer from Google and their TOUs are too general. Usually fine art is, is uh, covered. But I needed to make these anyway. And I'm pretty sure that some collections will want them even if I don't sell them. <laughs> so did I anticipate doing all of that? No. Should I have done my sculptures first? Yes, Sako, where the heck are those sculptures? <laughs> So I think we've covered some of this, but Daniel is asking, you know, get your best advice for those who want to embrace more of your rare photographic philosophy and what are, were, what are or were some of your best photographic learning experiences? Well, that's a great, that's a great question. Um, I actually have a whole series of posts on my website called the story behind the photograph. And they're written from what creative thing did I learn from the making of this photograph? Mm -hmm. Not, What's the F sound? What lens did you use? <laughs> <laughs> Not that. Yeah. The dreaded Michael questions. Angelo, was it Windsor Newton? Was it Fox or Sable? I don't care. <laughs> you know, like, um, I'm not saying that the tools aren't important. I've, I've already been highlighting how this changes perception. But the tool, the tool facilitates it. it. It rarely generates it. Uh, so those blog posts, the story behind the image would be one start. If, if you really just want to look at why I'm really in this and what I'm doing uh, on my website, she, we noted the, the website has been broken apart into .com and .art and the .art section, there are a whole series of videos where I speak about 
the work and why I made the work. And uh, the two videos, one is Landscapes Within, which is kind of the overview. And the other is Alignment. I think you'll get a good sense of why I do what I do. Um, There's also a, a video up there called Sublime Moments. And that, that really tells you why I'm in it, but it also shares one story of me being in Death Valley at Zabriskie Point, making a photograph that took five or six shots that were then gonna be composited. It's the same composition, but the light is changing across the landscape. And so the final print has light that's selected from all five shots. I missed that shot the first time and it's my top selling print. Uh, I missed it because I was thinking in 120 fifths of a second, you know, my, my tradition, my training, my foundation led me to thinking in a specific way, even though I was using new tools and had a, a different agenda. You know, Jerry Olsman's agenda is the closest one that I, I relate to most strongly. Um, it's different. And so you think differently. Uh, and I remember getting back to uh, my friend's house on, in Carmel, uh, it was actually Hunt Witherell's wife, Tracy, who said, yeah, they're fantastic. Yes. I mean, you should have Hunt on here. I'm sure he'd be a fun conversation. Yeah, I should. Uh, He's a brilliant. Cars, cars and landscapes. Yeah, yeah. Well, so much. Mm -hmm. um, at any rate, Tracy said, so did you go to Zabriskie Point? And I knew it was a leading question. I said, uh-huh, I made the pilgrimage. I said, yeah, but I'll bet you could do it differently. And the minute she said it, I said, ah, oh, I missed it. I got to go back. <laughs> And it took me a year, sorry, Sako, but it took me a year to get back and make that shot. And I remember standing there with the tripod, all the other people are watching me wander away, come back to the tripod, take another shot. You know, that, that one camera and tripod didn't move at all. And I'd wander away and come back. And <laughs> it was so different than everybody else who'd set up and everybody waited for the sun to hit Manly Beacon, which is this beautiful peak. And that's kind of the crescendo in the landscape everybody waits for, that decisive moment of light. Um, where I was photographing long before they arrived and long after. And they're just looking at me like mm -hmm. this. And part of me is also doing this too. It's like, you have to grow, you know, it's just, but I, you can see I'm smiling. Um, I like it when I challenge myself. I'm endlessly curious. And if I'm not challenging myself, I'm kind of out. I need to push myself. I do this because I think creativity is the art of discovery. And it's not just discovery about the medium, it's, it's also discovery about the world. And in, in that way, the lens always points both ways. It points out at the world and it points in at the soul. And, and so it's a discovery on at least three levels, at least. So that's, that's why for me, it's all about questions. Questions guide the discovery. Yeah, the next question that came in takes us a little different direction. Linda's asking, can you talk a bit about choosing paper? What papers do you use, matte or glossy, textured or smooth? What helps you determine your choices? Um, As Jeff first, laughs at us. Yeah, right. <laughs> the first thing that I recommend anybody do is, is get a representative set of images, gang them up on something like an eight and a half by 11 uh, image, and then uh, print it out on as many different surfaces or substrates. And when I say substrates, I'm beyond paper. It could be plastic, it could be metal, it could be wood, it could be, you know, get beyond. It's not just paper, it's printmaking. And <laughs> I always joke, she we will remember this, Mac and I, Mac Holbert, used to have this shtick in the Epson Print Academy. Ah, oh, we're printing on substrates. It's, it's Italian, right? Like fragile. <laughs> <laughs> um, just, to, just get away from, it's not just paper. Um, that said, I do print on paper. I, I like matte organic surfaces. I'm a, I'm a naturalist. Uh, the plastic, shiny surfaces that hold gray blacks and a little more saturated color just feel too synthetic for me. So I'm willing to make those sacrifices, even if they're exhibited under glass. And I do prefer museum glass, but I really actually get to do that because when I ship my prints frame to museums, the glass breaks. Mm -hmm. So I recommend my collectors get a, you know, a low, low gloss, uh, good high quality glass that way. But I do this and I, I print out on a lot of different things, particularly when I'm dealing with new series. There might be well, there was one in particular where we had these really fantastic blacks and I've, I wondered if I would do that on exhibition fiber. And at this point, I'd be looking at the uh, Epson Platine, the legacy. Um, 
you know, kind of a silver gelatin equivalent actually has a black or black than silver gelatin, bright or white than silver gelatin, but it doesn't reflect light in the same way that my dad's silver gelatin prints do, right? It's, it's a different material, but it has an expanded dynamic range. And they were compelling. Um, I still to this day wonder if uh, the mat isn't going to help them unite with the other bodies of work and emphasize a different quality. Rob Carr, some of you might know who Rob is, a uh, wonderful retoucher and a classical pianist. He does uh, a lot of Greg Gorman's retouching. Uh, made a comment. He said, you know, but this matte one, it is softer, but it feels more moving, like it's more alive. And I was like, ah, okay. Moving alive is a really important quality for me. I want to be alive to the process. I want to treat land, all parts of land, organisms and minerals and air and water as living things like uh, so many poets and even painters like O'Keefe recommended that people do. It's that, that more sacred way of participating, a sense of respect for that. And so when he said living, I said, okay, there's my answer. It wasn't, it wasn't DMAX and it wasn't ISO brightness and it wasn't gamut and it wasn't uh, acuitance or picoliters. Uh, it, it was alive that guided me to my uh, final answer. That said, you can tell I know the language and I do my tests and I really do feel like good craft helps elevate the work. And that's not a matter of ego for me. Uh, I do take pride in what I do, but really for me, it's about honoring the gift I've been given by the subject, the work, the experience itself. I, I feel it's my responsibility to live up to, to rise to the gifts that I've been given. Well, Linda follows up with that. She was in your class at Santa Fe, and when you showed print, she wept at the beauty. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank and it's probably just a time to mention that Thursday's conversation is going to be with Drew Hendricks from Red River Paper. So if you have questions about inkjet printing papers, bring them here on Thursday. Mm. Um, let's see, what else? Janet Jeffers is asking, what destination is on the top of your list to visit and photograph once travel is safe again? Um, Seth and I almost ran that Namibia aerial workshop and um, I'm just dying to go back there and do that again. The first time that I was able to do this image back behind me, Seth wasn't on that trip, but you know, we did do several trips after that where we did it. It, it was like being in heaven, just, just a mm -hmm. slice of heaven. So that, that is still calling me and it's also relevant to a, a body of work that I'm developing right now. Um, I also had a fabulous go? time. What's that? We're ready to go. Once, once That's right. <laughs> as, soon as, as soon as we're good to go, we're good to go. We got the whole thing planned out. Yes, I was just. I also just want to go fly with Seth again in, in uh, Iceland. We had a great time <laughs> over the Iceland rivers. I'd never stood out on the, uh, the, the railing out there in the rain. It was a lot of fun. Um, well, there are stories about, there too. Yeah. <laughs> talking about flying, one of our people in the audience here, Ian, Ian Citrin, is going to be a guest here next week to talk nice. about his work. Um, Jeff Shuey is asking, how has your relationship with other photographers impacted your growth as an artist? And do you steal or are you influenced by the relationships? Huh. Um, it's, it's influenced me profoundly. Uh, ever since I was a kid, and I wasn't their colleagues, but I was just watching what they're up to. You know, and it's a little different, you know, when, yeah, at any rate, dad and mom introduced me to a lot of different people. And I think the biggest thing that I learned is everybody's different and that's reflected in their work and their lifestyle. You know, they're, um, so that was, that's tremendously useful. But it, you know, it's conversations with Seth, it's conversations with you, very different kinds of conversations that uh, help me figure out what I'm doing. You often push me to uh, say, hey, JP, what the heck is going on? And you know, what, what photographs did you learn the most from or <laughs> it could be silly things like, you know, what do you taste in that wine? Don't answer that question. <laughs> um, it's still, it's still very influential. And it's one of the reasons I love doing the uh, 50 conversations that are up on my website. And I'm thinking about starting that up again on zoom mm -hmm. in part of is a response to what you're doing here, John. I think Great. this is fabulous. And the Thank kind you. of community dialogue that goes on. I know how much Mike Newler is enjoying it. I know she mm -hmm. and I are enjoying it tremendously. <laughs> That, that kind of exchange of ideas, fantastic. But the question of stealing, you know, I've, Austin Kleon's book, Steal Like an Artist. Yeah. I love the little book. I hate the phrase. Mm -hmm. There's got to be a different way of saying steal because, you know, 
influence is very different than theft. Uh, and I understand it's a sensational way, and Picasso was a sensationalist, and that's where it comes from, and he's, he's great at PR. But I, I think one has to figure out how those influences work on you and what it takes to make it your own. And if you haven't made it your own, uh, it's a great disservice, not just to the other artist. It is really bad form. And I know that when people have ripped me off, that uh, it, it's really affected me. But more importantly, I, I see some people do that, and... They cheated themselves too. And I know that if I ever did that, I'd, I'd be A, fooling myself. And look, if I can't be honest with myself, what have I got? And number two, I would have stopped my own growth. I wouldn't have gone as far as I needed to go to figure out what I was bringing to the picture. Uh, so it, it's, it, it works both ways. That said, I have clip files. I did this as an illustrator. I do this as an artist today of people whose work inspires me. I'm, I'm restlessly looking at Pinterest and Instagram and doing web searches. It's part of the visual research. Howard Schatz recommended developing photographers that they develop a large visual library and that he himself at his age goes down to Rizzoli and looks at a thousand images every day, magazines, books, all the rest of it. He's just, you know how restlessly creative he is. And part of that is he feeds himself. You know, I think we need to feed ourselves that mm -hmm. inspiration. Well, I like incorporation and um, absorb uh, rather than steal and influence because um, if you actually have a single image in your mind and trying to recreate it, that's theft. If you have a series of images, particularly in all the spots where we all photograph, you know, how do you go to Death Valley and shoot a different photograph? But if you have all of the different mind, all the different images in your mind that you can call upon to look at in your mind and to avoid the, the common and um, try to develop the unique, that's where I think um, incorporation and embodiment and all of that stuff, it's better than steel. And I said steel because, you know, great art is steel. And that's what Picasso said. Right. But... The other thing is I know that you're heavily influenced and one of the greatest um, enjoyments that I had was sitting in Seth's apartment in Miami after a, the Miami Print Academy and we were showing prints, showing and images. Drinking good wine. Huh? <laughs> and drinking very good wine. <laughs> um, lots of very good expensive wine. I won't say, um, although quite honestly, pretty impressive uh, that um, uh, I wish I ha I somewhere I, I may do. actually have the photographs of that. Yeah, we'll um, take but those out. Seth and JP had shot the same fucking iceberg, and two completely different approaches. Seth shot it with his three hundred two eight, probably handheld, and JP shot it with his fourteen. And they recognize the iceberg. We all recognize the iceberg because for some reason or another, it was kind of interesting and unique. And Seth was really influenced by JP's kind of wide angle approach. And Seth um, and JP talked about that. And it was like, that's what you saw. And, and, and JP was like influenced by what Seth saw. And then the next trip to Antarctica, it was funny because Seth was shooting with a 14 millimeter and JP was shooting with a 100 to 400 millimeter. Um, so learning how to look differently, uh, I think is, is that you can get influenced by other people's vision. And one of the great things that I love is going out with another photographer uh, and seeing what he saw after the fact. And it's like, I didn't see that. You know, Seth is particularly irritating in that way because he sees a lot of stuff that I don't see. Um, I see everything you see and, and JP, but <laughs> I'm kidding. But no, I'm just learning to see being influenced by other people's vision. Uh, and then I think also your attention to craft is something that uh, you don't push nearly as much as you should. You have a high degree of refined craftsmanship. And that is part of the art. You can't separate the, the craft of the print 
uh, from the image. It's it, basically adding the image plus the quality of the print uh, is really what transforms it and elevates it to art. So that's it, I'll shut up. <laughs> um, just to follow up what Jeff said there, people want to see a portion of Seth and my extended conversation. We have a free ebook that's up on the Digital Photo Destinations website or on my website. It's called Antarctica Two Visions. And it shows Seth's take on Antarctica, my take on Antarctica. And then the third section is images shot on the same location, the same subject by him and by me compared. And it's free, it's just up, it's up on the website, so. And I absolutely love that book. And it was because of that, the fact that you realize you both shot the exact same thing in totally different ways. And, and both true. arrived at really um, neat images. It's remarkable how many times we've actually done that, Jeff. I mean, it's- Oh, I know. I mean, you can't like, help- We come back on the boat together and, and I mean, there's times where we're in different Zodiacs and we both shot the exact same iceberg from the same, <laughs> I mean, like you can match them up and other times where, you know, com completely the same iceberg and completely different takes on it. Really fascinating. And it is a great learning experience to look at anybody, um, not not with the idea of, of, and I hate the word stealing and, and even copying, but how to make it your own. And by learning what other people see and what, what other people are doing, it's actually one of the best mechanisms of learning how to, what, what's gonna work for you and what's gonna enable you to make it your own. Cool. So Martin Reiki is asking, you see art as a way of life like Kim and Brett Weston. Kim has his gardens and cooking as part of what of this. What do you do as a non-image making part of your life? I play two, I play piano at two o'clock in the morning when nobody else can get hurt. <laughs> <laughs> I do a lot of writing and that this poetry immersion has been uh, really wonderful uh, this year. I've done it all along, but like now I've really gotten into it. Um, I do a lot of studies in drawing, painting, um, and then sometimes it's just put all that down and just go take a long walk or a long swim, do a lot of, a lot of meditation. Um, been playing video games more recently. Hmm. And I noticed the video games that I love, the my top three video games, and I'm, I'm kind of two thirds of the way through one of my top three video games called The Ghost of Tsushima. Yeah, it's, it's a samurai kind of game. But the thing about it is the relationship to the land. And I noticed that every game that I love, there has this natural environment that you're deeply immersed in and that you have to kind of map in your head and, and I've even developed this strange tick. You don't have to do it in, the grand, in this game, but I've been bowing to the flowers before I pick them. <laughs> and you don't get extra points, <laughs> to it, but I like what it does to me inside. Yes. And I wrote a poem about it. <sighs> so, you know, inspiration come all kinds of places, including video games. You know? mm -hmm. um, yeah, and for those that are new to the conversations, Kim Weston was a guest here a few weeks ago. And if you go back to my archives at cornicello.com conversations, you can find that. Yeah, so talk about the legacy there. And, and Kim loves to push it. I mean, he paints on his photographs. Yes. And one of the most interesting things he showed me at Wildcat, which is the old Weston mm -hmm. uh, farm, so to speak, at Wildcat Creek, was he has this beautiful little wooden sculpture, Saka, a little wooden sculpture. Brett had mm -hmm. mapped out the shapes of the shadows in his dune pictures and then sculpted the shadows. He eliminated the dune and he just showed the form of the shadow. I was like, oh, that's really interesting. Yeah. I've never seen that before. <laughs> I'm that's planning just... to visit with Kim in September if travel is okay and if the fires aren't happening yeah. there. So, yeah, you'll yeah I'm looking forward family. to that. Yeah. And Hunt's just right around the corner and so is John Sexton. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah Hunt, I usually see Hunt on those trips too. Yeah. So, Seth, we're coming to the end here. Do you want oh. to show some of your photos here? <laughs> uh, some and I don't know if Jeff has any. Yeah, well, um, I'll sh show a few moments here. <laughs> <laughs> so um, this is South America. Um, Travels with Uranus, JP. Probably Point Uranus. I, I think it was JP. <laughs> and then um, and JP's um, dated this lovely critter. <laughs> the alien. <laughs> After we tried some hot sauce. Trusta. And she crawled up next to him. <laughs> Do you remember the alien fetuses and jars they were selling? And they had the alien vehicle. The alien vehicle, which was that really that cool. That was great. 
57 Chevy with rockets and four aliens in it ready to blast off. <laughs> and then this is Japan yeah. where we had the opportunity to try some blowfish. And Saka was there, wasn't she? Saka was definitely there. Yeah. And, um, and JP uh, was very hesitant. <laughs> and, <laughs> very uh, hesitant. It was like, and then no. decided from peer pressure to engage, at which point he promptly left the room and passed out on the floor. <laughs> And then show back up for dinner about 40 minutes later. Pure white. <laughs> it was a combination of anxiety and fury that I had caved into peer pressure. <laughs> the one was, just fueled the other and got out of control. Yeah, awesome. Um, <laughs> <laughs> JP in Morocco. Salam alaikum. <laughs> Laying with the rattlesnakes. Here's snaky, snaky, snaky. Here's snaky, snaky, snaky. That's snakey. a joke between me and Seth. <laughs> we literally walked around doing that. Finally, the snake comes out. It was awesome. <laughs> I'm getting eaten by a giant puffin. Puffin. And then, you know, I've been teaching Jay. Uh, Jay, yeah. I've been <laughs> teaching JP more about Judaism and how Moses walked on water. And finally, he, um, he started to figure it out, and now he, he's able to truly walk across water in, um, in his been classic teaching pose, me. looking up at the sky like that. He's been teaching me Yiddish. I guess this is what happens when you schwitz. Playing <laughs> 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 with the himba, showing them an iPhone, playing you soccer. You remember that? That was an awesome time. I, can't believe, I can't believe he's wearing black in Africa. Oh, of yeah, course. Neither, neither could they. Jeff, I got to tell you the story. We're coming out of, um, the, I just showed you, Sausage Lay. Uh, we're coming off a of dead lay, and it's early morning. So I'm looking into the, the light when I hear this voice out of the bushes. I'm like, JP, JP. And I'm looking, I can't see anything. It's like, who is that? It's Kali, our guide from up way north on the uh, Skeleton Coast, just happened to be walking out of the bushes at them. Said, "How'd you know it was me?" And he just bursts out laughing. And I said, "Okay, fair enough. I get it." And then, um, and then the famous hair. And this was in Antarctica. We were you get a whole idea of how the weather changes in Antarctica. We were on one side of a glacier where you could drop a feather and it would drift slowly down. And then we learned what catabatic winds are. Catabatic winds with orographic precipitation. <laughs> <laughs> Coming down the side of the glacier, the winds hit about over 100 miles an hour. Um, and JP's hair really um, did a whole ballet. Actually, JP did a ballet and <laughs> became airborne as well. Um, Remember uh, Kiwi? The waterfalls were going back up the mountain, and yeah, there was one of the coolest water spouts. Thing. Waterfalls going up in the <clears throat> up in the air. We saw it in Iceland once too. Yeah. And then, um, was this New Zealand where we found Bigfoot and his shoes for you? Um, I keep thinking that's Japan, but maybe was it, it is. Japan? Oh, maybe it was Japan. Oh, well, that looks Japan. Yeah, it probably was Japan. Our blue man group didn't last very long. Yeah. Do not do this at home. Putting plastic <laughs> bags on your head and sucking out the oxygen is really not creative. <laughs> and the masked man back, uh, back in Morocco. Morocco. Just some fun little moments. It Thank was you. fun to put them together. Travels with JP. <laughs> Travels with JP. <laughs> So JP, is it okay if Jeff shares Mike has learned to bring whiskey. JP, I also, um, I also have a few pictures of you. Um, would it be okay for me to show them? Absolutely. You can embarrass me yet again. <laughs> All would not be right with the universe if you didn't. Any would mission. So can you see that? Yes. Okay. Yes. Our, our first trip down was almost didn't happen because the uh, 
um, air, the pilots went on strike. And so Cork literally- The country went on strike, Jack. Leased a 747 to take a, well, to go down to pick up people to bring them home. But so we got a, a, a pretty easy trip down and always working, always uh, thinking about things. And then the three amigos, I love this shot. I had a, do you have a copy of this, JP? I'm not sure I do. I, I might have a low res one, but I'd love a higher res one. Okay. Um, and then <laughs> um, hair down instead of hair back. Um, this was um, the proboscis, the, the <laughs> protrusion of the proboscis. Fascinated. Oh, one of the fun trips down there. Uh, <laughs> that was your face. Awesome. JP spent the whole trip down sitting next to Bill Atkinson. If you don't know oh, who Bill is. Four and a half hours. Yeah. And Bill. Oh, at the other end of the 747. <laughs> Bill awesome. actually never shuts up. No. Uh, and remarkably, and Seth and I are sitting next to each other right in front of Bill and, and JP. And, and you know, I mean, he's talking about artificial intelligence. He's talking about... <laughs> Um, uh, origin of life, yep. uh, um, you know, particle physics. He's talking about all kinds of stuff. And Seth and I are like uh, feeling real sorry for JP. <laughs> and we, we said, JP, are you okay? And JP absolutely loved it because I Bill is fascinating. And he is, it, it's he's fun one of to the be around. I've ever met. Yeah. Um, and I've, I, you know, our old landlord used to be Stanislav Ulam, who invented the hydrogen bomb. That, oh. that guy's off the charts. <laughs> Do you remember, you know, he's talking about artificial, um, artificial intelligence. He's working with a think tank in Silicon Valley called Numenta. And he says, JP, JP, there's no skull cap. Do you know what that means? I said, yeah, somebody's going to invent a brain bigger than yours. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then also our first trip was uh, buying the wine <laughs> with uh, Michael. And uh, we always like to get our heads together. Is that Dano? Dano. <laughs> resemblance. <laughs> are you talking about me or you? <laughs> I think me, JP. There that's is a not, That's not Dano. Yeah. Oh. No. I, I, I like this one. Seth and JP looking in two different directions. <laughs> and then uh, <laughs> Seth turns around and takes a look. It, it is fun because you're, you're down there in Antarctica. Oh, there's the 100 to 400. <laughs> Um, you're down there in Antarctica, and it's there is stuff to shoot everywhere. Uh, here, another shot of the three of us, and just proof that um, after 14, <laughs> 18 days at sea, Seth started to look really attractive to both of us. <laughs> that are leopard seals. Um, and then I had the advantage of having a, a personal tour um, around Cushing, Maine. Uh, JP literally picked me up before sunrise. Uh, and um, we went out shooting at sunrise and absolutely gorgeous. And of course, JP shooting with his damn cell phone. Did you actually bring a real camera? I don't remember. I, I don't, I see you shooting with the, the cell phone. And it was a gorgeous uh, environment. And you can see, uh, I asked JP to get down, so he's way on the far left. And um, this was the blueberries with frost. And of course, JP shooting. And this, this is at your house um, and the living room. I, I love this. Yeah. I mean, it's just, I don't know if it's still like this, but yeah. prints everywhere and really soft pillows everywhere. And yeah. I think there's a relationship between lots of pillows and a lot of prints. <laughs> and then um, I had the advantage of getting JP in my studio and I finally gave him uh, the raw processed images uh, because I've got shots that, that I didn't, I thought you didn't like JP. So I never actually gave them but it is kind of fun to go through no, I and I, I need some more so that's fantastic thank you jeff um 
because I really love the expressiveness of this. And the interesting thing is that although this was in 2008, so 12 years ago, um, you actually still kind of look the same, which is <laughs> mildly irritating. And then of course, JP, um, if you were to actually tie his hands behind his back, he would be mute. All right. <laughs> <laughs> That last one is when I've been around Shibi too much. <laughs> oh, the ears uh, plugged? Yeah. Yeah. I, I particularly like this one. Yeah, I do too. Yeah. It's a great. It, it, he kind of reminds me of, a little bit of Jesus. <laughs> a wee bit. That's why he had to learn to walk on water. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you can keep the cross, boys. <laughs> okay. Well, I want to thank you all. This has been great. Do you have any final words you want to share, John Paul? Um, if, if you want to know more about my world, go and sign up for my newsletter. There's going to be all kinds of things coming out this fall. It's been uh, a very productive uh, quarantine for me, uh, one that I plan to uh, repeat every year, not for as long, but I've been talking about needing a month off every year, and boy, boy have I proved the value of that. <laughs> So new ebooks, new videos, all the rest. Just go to my news, my webpage, and just sign up for my newsletter. Great. Yeah. Well, thanks, everyone. Again, we'll be here on Thursday with Red River Papers and then next Monday with Ian Citrin. So I'm uh, looking forward to all this coming up. So everyone be well. I'm going to stop Facebook. Thanks for coming, everyone. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Marcia. John. This is wonderful. You're so very welcome. Thank yeah. you all for being part Thank of this. You. I really appreciate thanks, it. Thanks, everybody. Terrific. Thanks, JP. Thank you. Marcella, how's Chile? Chile good? <laughs>